How can a whole world be waiting and not even know it? As God's creating the perfect plan and just waiting to show it. star hung in the sky and just below it the most unlikely gift, given in a most unexpected way, the fullness of God laying in hay a day that changed everything, a virgin girl giving birth to a boy, no, a king, and they bring him gifts of gold sing him praise, extolled him because he displays the answers to prophecies foretold before his days, he has come. Let it be known, little boy, play your drum, parappa pum pum, let it be shown, the Son of God is here. Draw near to his people, so incline your ear to hear the good news. A baby boy laying in a manger. A mere stranger to this earth would save us from the danger of our sin, but it started at his birth. He birthed hope into this world and proved to us our worth. This infant, worth more than prizes offered by kings, because simply in coming, he offered us everything. And we don't just remember what was, but celebrate him. Distinctly one, yet distinctly three, most holy. King of glory, Lamb of God, Redeemer, Friend, First and last, Alpha and Omega, Light of the world, Prince of peace, Lord of lords, King of kings, Name above all names, Messiah, Savior, Promise fulfilled, Emmanuel, God with us, bright and morning star, the great I am, you are the Christ. The giver of life, he is Jesus, and he has come. Merry Christmas Eve, Eve. We are so glad that you are you're here and you uh, you chose to come out and celebrate the fact that he has and is come. It is good that we could come uh, and worship together as a family, as Pleasant Chapel, to do to do just to just this. Advent hope moves us. Advent love leads us. Advent joy stirs us. Advent peace stills us that we might affirm our King Jesus. It's time we set aflame this Advent affirmation by lighting this Christ candle. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judea. He was the long-awaited Messiah whose coming was prophesied. The same Jesus lives in our hearts today. He deserves our highest loyalty and total commitment. In Jesus Christ, our hope is fulfilled, our love is consummated, our joy is complete, and our peace is sealed. Rejoice, a Savior is born, a Savior is born indeed. Joy to the world. Would you remain standing and pray with me, please? Our Father, we just praise you and thank you, and we stop uh, this time right now that we could come this Christmas Eve Eve because it's, it's about you. We are grateful that we, we live where we can do just this, where we can, we can come and we can freely worship you. And we do this as we re-remember this great thing that you did for us so long ago. It's so valuable to our lives. We just, we pause to do this to recenter all of our lives on you in this great work that you've done when you became flesh specifically for us. In this joy that we will have as we come together as a family, as we, as we sing, and as we listen to your word, and as we, as we have laughter together, we, we pray that you too would have joy in your heart as you see this as true worship of you. We give you this time, and we give you all that we have uh, this evening as we come to praise your name. And it's in your very son's name we pray. Amen. 
If you have been with us the last several weeks of, as we have celebrated uh, the Advent season for the last four, four Sundays, you know that we've been taking a, a kind of a fresh approach to an old familiar story. We have, we have looked at the Christmas story from, from the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2 that we all know so well, but we've looked at it from the perspective of the angels. What it would have been like for that first Christmas for those heavenly beings that were assigned such important responsibilities to the, to the telling and the acting out of this greatest story ever told, what would it have been like for them? You know, we typically look at the story sometimes from, and we've done it in the past here, we've looked at what was Christmas like uh, from Joseph's eyes or what it would have been like from Mary's eyes or, or what it would have been like from the eyes of a, of a shepherd. But this year we've kind of looked at it uh, from a, freshly from what perhaps it would have been like to be an angel. And now no doubt we've had to kind of pretend and imagine a little bit because there's not a whole lot written what this would have been like. But in that imagination to me, uh, to me I think it just brings out a, a deeper richness of this great news that we have that Christ, Christ has come. And so what we talked about is what it was that those, those angels did. You know, they, they were assigned this task to go to talk to a particular group of people and, and give them a particular set of instructions. And now at this point in the story, you know, that, that's done. Uh, they've told the people the things that they needed to tell them. And, and now it seems like their job is just, I got to kick back and just watch and see what it is that's going to happen. What is it that God is about to do here? And remember... You know, early on, one of the people that, that the angels talked to was the father of John the Baptist, whose name was Zechariah. You know, they told Zechariah that he was going to have a son, and his son was going to be an important player in the role of Christ in, in his ministry. He would, he would be the forerunner of Christ, and he would introduce him as Messiah as Jesus' adult ministry would begin. And those angels had to go and tell John the Baptist's father what was going on. And then they had to go and talk to Mary about what it was going to happen with her. And that would have been, you know, some strange news that she was, she was with child. And she knew that there was no real natural human biological way she should be with child. And so that would have been something, you know, very difficult for her to hear. But that was a message that the angels would tell her. And they had another difficult message that they would have had to tell Joseph. Maybe it was even more strange for him what he had to do. The angels told Joseph, we want you to take Mary to be your wife. And she's currently carrying a child that's not yours. That'd be pretty tough for a guy to do that. And even more than that, we want you to be a father to this child who is not your own. That was a difficult message that the angels gave to Joseph. And then they came to those shepherds. Those shepherds, those kind of lowly, unsophisticated dudes out in the field. And they're out there taking care of their sheep. And the angels came to them and gave them this great responsibility of being the bearers of this news. They were the first ones outside of that family to hear, to hear this good news that was coming. And I think that those angels commissioned those lowly, unsophisticated shepherds to be the first preachers, the first evangelists. Because they told them to go and see this and then proclaim it and begin to tell the world this great story. And we don't know this for sure, but I'm kind of guessing that those, those strange people that came from the east, somehow they had to know to, to follow that star. Some, someone had to tell them. I, maybe it was those angels. Maybe they told those people of another culture and of another religion to, to follow that star. And when you get there, bring those gifts that you have to this young couple and that child. And so from what, was it, what would have that been like for those angels that did this? All, all this, these messages they, they had to tell. I can't but help imagine what it would have been, it would have been like for them. You know, they, they're not all knowing. They wouldn't have known the full impact of what this story was going, uh, how it was going to unfold. They didn't know the outcome of this, but, but they were obedient. And they followed the commandments of, of God to go and tell these people these things. And they did that. And so now it was time for them to just kick back. And the scripture tells us that they, they longed to see these things that were about to happen. For years and years, they wanted to see what God was about to do that he did on that first Christmas. So we pick up the story in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2, around verse 15. This is just after the angels have met with those, those shepherds. They told them to go to Bethlehem and, and see this thing. So after the angels had left them and gone back to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Hey, let's, let us go back to Bethlehem and see this thing that's taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. 
So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at the shepherds, that what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And then we pick up on the story about those magi that came from the east. They had been traveling, and when that star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. <laughs> Clearly they had been traveling a long time, so they were probably a little jazzed. that finally their trip, it was over, and they were filled with joy. They entered the house, and they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so with those couple of passages, we begin to piece together this, this image that's, that's on our bottom of the, of the screen here. This, this nativity scene that's also familiar for us as we retell this story of the coming of Christ. And in that scene, we see in that first Christmas scene, Mary and Joseph and Jesus. They did what the angels told them to do. Joseph stayed with Mary and Mary gave birth to that son and she named him Jesus the shepherds came because the angels told them to come. And when they went there, they, they, shared, they shared the story. And they're part of this image and this picture that we have of Christmas. And those magi came that probably were told by the angels as well. That long journey took place and they were now there and brought those very valuable gifts to the couple and to the child. And so... Those angels, they longed to see what was happening, and they, and with great anticipation, they, they gave those instructions to those people. And now as they break into and peek into the world to see what is happening, they watch how this plan of God is unfolding on that first Christmas. Light, light was coming. Light, light came. Those angels had heralded its coming all the way, and they just couldn't wait to see it. They couldn't wait to see how this light would play out. And everybody they told this story to, they saw that those people had responded, and they came and made this Christmas possible. And you know, on that night, that first Christmas night, our world, our world changed. This world changed forever because of what was happening this dark, dark world that was so broken had light break into it. This light that brings life, that's what it does. And it brings life to those who would receive it. A son would come and he would be the means by which people could experience real forgiveness and have a restored relationship back with their Creator. And this light that came in the form of a child would be the source and meaning and purpose for life here and now. And that light would also be the assurance of an eternal life forever in the presence of our Father. This light that came was eternally present with those angels. All of their existence up to this point, they were in perfect experience of pure light. They were with the sun for all of their existence. And now that light was breaking in to our world. We read about this light from several passages in the Bible. A couple I wanted to in include this evening comes from John chapter 1 and verse 9. And John says, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. A reference to Christ that comes. And then in Jesus' very ministry, he takes that which is coming and he puts it right back on to himself. In chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus says this to his disciples, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Angels proclaim this light was coming. And now Jesus self-proclaims that I am it. I am the light of the world. And then later in his ministry, he will take that concept of light coming into the world and he will personalize it in a hurry because he takes that light and he puts it right back on us. As he says this from chapter five of the book of Matthew, you, 
You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Light was coming and light did come. Those angels proclaimed it and they just waited to see what it would happen. They longed to see what this light would do in this world. And I believe today they are still longing to see what that light will do in your world. Will you receive that light as it comes to you? You know, light came on that first, that first Christmas. But to me, I don't believe the light really became effective until an Easter, which happened 33 years later. Because it was there on a cross that I believe it was that light that really did its most effectiveness for you and me. It was that light from a cross and a grave that brought you and I forgiveness. And it took care of the darkness in our lives that you and I all possess. So yeah, you and I, you know, it's Christmas Eve Eve and we're here celebrating Christmas and this wonderful joy that Jesus came as a child on that Christmas so long ago. But we also participate in what makes that day so significant. And it was Easter. It was Easter that makes Christmas so great. And so we're going to do that this evening. We are going to participate in in communion here and participate in the death and resurrection of Christ as we as we partake in these in these elements. Uh, communion th- this evening because of where we're at you should have uh, elements in your pews that's a little a little uh, tub that has a cup there and a wafer there for you as well uh, just a little bit of instructions I would peel off get your wafer out first and then peel off and take uh, um, expose the cup for, for your drink if you do it different what you'll end up with is uh, is something in your lap and you won't like that so when when we get ready to do it you'll do it that way Communion is open for everyone. If you are, if you are a member or not, uh, if you in your heart would like to have a right relationship with God, you may participate in communion in this in this church. So yeah, as we think about communion, you know, it was I like to think of that first communion meal as a party that you and I would participate in. I, that's how I view it. We have reunions and we have gatherings and we have traditions, and I believe that's that's what was going on. And it was at that party that that Jesus would institute a brand new covenant with his followers. And what he did that evening was he took he took bread and he gave thanks and praise to you, Father, for this bread. And then he took that bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this this is my body and this body is given for you. Take and eat this and, and do this in remembrance of me. That had such significance to those people then, but I think it has just as much significance for you and I today. For that light that came into the world, that light comes to you and me as we participate in his body that was given for us. Later in that evening, Jesus took the cup and again he gave thanks and praise to God and he told his disciples that this cup is the new covenant and in it is my blood which is the forgiveness of sins for all people take and and drink this and do this in remembrance of me and again then 2000 years ago what significance that meant for him but for us today that light has come in the form of spilled blood for the forgiveness of your sins and for my sins would you pray with me Our Father, we are at this point being obedient to you because you asked us to do just this. To do this in remembrance of you because you did this for us. It is only by your shed blood given for us that we can stand boldly before you because we are in right relationship with you because of the forgiveness and mercy that comes through your Son. Would you right now just pour out your blessing upon what it is that we are doing in this time, would you allow us this time of, of silent prayer that you would hear us individually pray to you as we would thank you and praise you for the things that you've done for us. Here too as well as we would confess those things that we need to confess before you. We thank you in your son's name. Amen. 
So you may partake of your elements and we'll just have a time of silent prayer together. You know, I'm just, uh, I love this time of year in this church. You know, people worked hard to put these billions of lights up in this church. It just makes it gorgeous. You know, the lights on the outside kind of accent the stained glass and lights. It's about light. And, you know, it's not just because it, it looks cool. We do it in a church because it's very symbolic of this light that we've been talking about. Light has come. And that light came in the form of a child who grew up to die on a cross for you and I. That's why we decorate our church with lights, because we want to remember that. And, you know, each year it's been a tradition in this church that we have a, we close out our service by singing Silent Night and having a candlelight ceremony. We're going to do that again. It's going to be a little bit different this year, but we're going to do that. Because I think there's some very rich symbolism in what it is that we do with that light. Because we, we come to the Christ candle here. And we acknowledge that, that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one. And I receive this light from him in that Christ candle. And this symbolically is saying, you, you are the light of this world, but I receive you. This is the light that is in, in me now. And likewise, we are to take that light and it's to go, it's to go from here in, into, other, into the rest of the world. And so symbolically, we take that light. And we light a candle symbolically saying that my light is, the, is Christ in me. And I take this light to a world that is so desperately in need of you. So we'll do this right now. Would you stand and we're going to sing Silent Night. You saw how I did it there. There are these sticks that are up here. We'll begin to sing the song. And when you want to come up, come up with your family. We've got two stations here. There are two stations in the back. You can come up, light a candle, put your sticks out in the, in the jar. And when you're done, we'll just kind of push out to the sides. And uh, we'll just stand there and we will continue singing Silent Night. And then we'll close with a blessing. So let us stand and let us sing Silent Night.
May the Lord bless us, and may the Lord keep us, and may the light of his face shine upon us and give us peace. Amen? Amen. Merry Christmas, and thank you for coming this evening.